Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. This week, three Santa Clara County Corrections officers were charged with beating a mentally ill inmate to death. On tonight's program, we'll talk with the judge who runs the Santa Clara County Mental Health Court. We'll also talk with federal judge Jeremy Fogel about the impact of his ruling on California's lethal injection procedures. But first, lawmakers have just a few more hours to pass or kill bills. The state's legislative session ends tonight. John Myers of KQED's California Politics and Government Desk has been following the action and he joins us now from Sacramento. Hi, John. Hello, Twee. Well, John, uh, we know the governor pushed hard this year for a bill aimed at fighting climate change. He's not getting everything he wanted. What happened with that? Uh, really, I think, Twee, it's two words, big oil. Uh, big oil and a lot of interest groups like the oil industry uh, have been fighting tooth and nail on this climate change bill, one particular part of it. You know, when the bill began, and we should say it was really the marquee bill of 2015, when the bill began, it had three parts, more renewable energy, more energy efficient buildings, and a 50% cut in petroleum use in cars and trucks in California uh, by the year 2030. That last part, the petroleum part, gone. Big oil fought it. They found enough uh, Democrats in the state assembly, moderate Democrats who generally were worried about the economic impacts and other elements. That is out. I think it is a very big loss, at least politically and maybe policy-wise, for the governor. And it is a rare big loss for him because uh, in this historic fourth term, he's won most of the Capitol dogfights. Uh, he's acknowledged that he lost this one skirmish but vows to try again. What are his chances given the current makeup of the state legislature? Well, you know, I think his chances are pretty good, but not so much because of the legislature, but really because of the power that the governor has. The governor has tremendous regulatory authority. I think people should think about this. You know, there are two ways to make things happen on the policy front in California, either through new laws, which is the legislature and statutes, or regulations, which is controlled by the governor's administration. The State Air Resources Board, the governor believes, has an awful lot of power to do a lot of this on its own. He said that they're going to be pushing some new standards on low carbon fuel in California. The oil industry may not like that. I think the governor may find some more friends in the legislature ultimately, though I think this moderate tone of Democrats is something that's really fascinating to watch. But the bottom line to me is I think the governor has a lot of this power uh, on that regulatory front with his own administration, and I think we're going to see him use it. There's been a lot of frantic activity in Sacramento in, these, uh, in, in this week, uh, winding down to the end of the legislative session. Uh, what are some of the biggest winners and losers? Well, I think if you look at big winners, you certainly would have to talk about these moderate Democrats, first of all. They almost have a, a, a new moniker here in Sacramento, Valleycrats, because a lot of them are from the Central Valley. They see issues far differently than their liberal Democratic colleague friends in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles. I think they're winners politically. I think on the policy front, you certainly would have to say people who want gender equity in the workplace won. The governor signed recently this law that uh, mandates equal pay for men and women women who are doing basically the same job. I think that's a big win. On the loser column, I certainly think transportation advocates feel like they've lost because there's been no uh, movement, no deal on a new way to fund transportation in California. And also really tough losers and very unhappy about it, advocates for the developmentally disabled in California. They wanted new money through the uh, legislature's special work on health care funding. Both of those issues, Twee, transportation and health care, ran headfirst in Republicans who did not want to increase taxes. And that's where it's going to end, it looks like, by the time the final gavel goes down. What about the racial profiling bill, uh, John? That made it through in this year of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one, although it is not the bill that the uh, legislative authors wanted. The, the bill essentially, if the governor signs it into law, and that's what we have to watch, the bill essentially says more data collection and more uh, publicity, more uh, disclosure of data by law enforcement about everybody they have a contact with, uh, by race, by ethnicity. Uh, it does not go as far as some people wanted. It does not address the issue, for example, of body cameras through law enforcement agencies. I think you're going to see more action on that next year. Which measures has uh, Governor Brown already vetoed? Well, uh, the bills are coming in left and right, and he's got some time to work on those. Uh, there are a couple of uh, ones that he has vetoed, looking in particular on, um, on enacting new crimes and new penalties for new crimes. Uh, the governor essentially saying in a veto message, we've got plenty of laws in the books for everything humans can do. We don't need another one of those. And I think that's an interesting message about how far the governor is willing to go into putting new, um, new penalties on the books for, for lower level crimes. 
And also the governor has uh, looked at a lot of other measures that he's uh, not thrilled on in terms of um, uh, drones and these private aircraft flying over people's houses. There was a bill to say you had to leave 350 feet of privacy space. Governor said no. We need to study it more. We don't know the impacts. That's a disappointment for privacy advocates. And the vetoes that he has made so far, John, do they reveal anything broader about his political thinking here? Well, you know, the governor has a, a, a very famous um, uh, tendency to, to zig left and zig right, or as he called it, the, the paddle theory, the, canoeing, uh, the canoe theory, rather, paddling to the left, paddling to the right. I think you see that a little bit. The governor still uh, aligns with law and order groups a lot when he's looking at things, and I think he, he likes to have fairly small movements on a lot of part of what uh, happens in California, though, of course, if you look at things like climate change and uh, water supply, he likes to look very big. But, um, you know, in general, the governor gives the legislature what it wants. And I think the next few weeks now will be interesting to see how many of these proposals he's willing to sign into law. Some of the most emotional debates this session involved the um, physician-assisted suicide bill. Governor Brown is a former uh, Jesuit seminary student. Um, has he given any signs where he stands on this deeply personal issue? No, he hasn't, and I think that is really going to be one of those things to watch. So we have seen this proposal, which would put California uh, in the category of a handful of other states that have provided a way for terminally ill patients to make their own choices about the end of their life with a physician's help. Uh, we've seen that, that measure stop and start in the legislature, and now here on this final day, we see it making its final passage and going to the governor's desk. You know, the one thing that we saw from Jerry Brown's office was a statement by one of his spokespeople recently that said, the governor doesn't believe that the way this has come forward as a, a vehicle in the special session of the legislature, that that's the appropriate way to bring this forward, which made a lot of people think that maybe he'll veto it saying, you should have done this the right way, gone through the right committees, the right legislative calendar. But I, I don't know that that's the case. I think that these are deeper personal issues. And you said it to you. I mean, this is a governor who has a long history in his life of thinking about spiritual issues and life issues. Uh, everybody is going to be watching what he does on that one. Uh, medical marijuana, another big issue, John, nearly 20 years after California uh, voters uh, decided to legalize it. There's now a legislat legislative deal finally to regulate it. Um, why did it take so long to get to this point? Boy, it's a great question. I mean, right, think about that. Almost 20 years since voters said yes to medical marijuana, but there hasn't been a broad state framework. I think if you talk to people involved in this issue, there have been so many different conflicting priorities. Growers of marijuana, distributors of medical marijuana, uh, local governments. We have certainly seen that in the Bay Area and other parts of California, how they uh, disagree on this. Some local governments don't want uh, medical marijuana uh, distributors in their communities. So I think it's been very complicated to, to get everybody on the same page. I think what you see here, though, um, is a proposal that creates a new state agency to kind of have a little bit of oversight. Um, I think key to the deal was two things, if I could. First one is it has bipartisan support. There are even some Republican law and order assembly members who have signed on to this compromise that was, uh, that was announced late Thursday night. And the second thing is 2016 is an election year. We all think a legalization measure for recreational use of marijuana is going to be on the ballot. I think everybody wanted the voters to see that we have a plan for the medical marijuana part of the community before they consider the broader use of marijuana in California. All right, well, that makes sense. And uh, John, just very quickly, what's the time frame for the governor to either sign or veto bills? Uh, just a few weeks. I think over the next two or three weeks, you're going to see hundreds of them come off his desk, sign, veto. It's going to be interesting to see how he does it. All right, John, a sleepless John Myers, who's been working very hard this week. Thanks so much. You're uh, John Myers of our California Politics and Government Desk. Three Santa Clara County correctional deputies are behind bars charged with killing an inmate in the jail where they worked. 31-year-old Michael Tyree was in jail for a probation violation and was awaiting transfer to a private mental health facility. According to a Sheriff's Department investigation, on the night of August 26th, County Corrections Officers Rafael Rodriguez, Matthew Ferris and Jera Lubrin entered Tyree's cell. Screaming could be heard throughout the pod for several minutes and was accompanied by the sounds of thumping, wall banging, and what sounded like blows to a person's body. The report also noted that Tyree could be heard yelling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, stop. Tyree was pronounced dead less than three hours later. The coroner concluded he died from multiple blunt force injuries and internal bleeding. 
On Thursday, county officials called for the creation of a special commission to examine the local jail system. Joining us next is Judge Stephen Manley, who heads the Santa Clara County Mental Health Court. That court seeks sentencing alternatives for mentally ill offenders. Manley was the judge who ordered Michael Tyree to a treatment program. Scott Schaefer has that interview. Judge Manley, welcome. Thank you. I know you can't talk about the Michael Tyree case uh, in correct. Santa Clara County, but there are a lot of people like him, people with mental illness who are in jails throughout California, throughout the country. What kinds of obstacles do they face? Well, those who enter the uh, criminal justice system, whether it's in my county or any other throughout California, they face um, incredible challenges. We have a, a broken system and they do not get the treatment they need. And what happens is so often is they continue to be arrested again and again. And the courthouse becomes like a revolving door. I used to say the jail was a revolving door, but now mentally ill people uh, are so often in the criminal justice system held for longer periods of time that it's really the court that becomes a revolving door. And uh, so their challenges are number one, uh, they are arrested for numerous charges. Um, they often receive punishment, but they very seldom ever receive meaningful treatment. So you're in charge of the mental health treatment court for Santa Clara County. How is your courtroom and what happens there different from another typical uh, courtroom? It's very different because it's not adversarial. We don't have the district attorney and the public defender or the defense attorney arguing and fighting about the charges or about what should be done. Everyone works in a collaborative way. We have a mental health team in the courtroom that talks to the offenders when they're in custody or when they're out of custody. We have a doctor available in the courthouse to provide interventions if needed. We have substance abuse counselors there right in the courtroom and adjacent to it. So what we're trying to do is intervene with the offender at the earliest possible point. Give us a sense of the range of mental health problems that the people who come before you have. Any and all uh, mental illnesses that you could imagine or think of or are known, uh, I see on a daily basis. Also, every level of offense, starting with the most minor uh, infractions or, or misdemeanors to very serious felonies. Offenders in our program are sent to our program by other judges of my court who the punishment issue is no longer before the court. The issue is not to return these individuals to the streets or to the community without treatment and to try and help them be successful and stop the rearrests. What kind of uh, training, special training, do the people who work in the courtroom, even the people who work, uh, sheriffs, deputies, court bailiffs, that kind of thing, how are they trained to deal with, with these folks? My deputies receive special training and they're carefully selected because it is very difficult to work with the mentally ill often, particularly in a confined setting, particularly when they're in custody in our courtroom. Uh, they are not only specially trained and specially selected, but um, there uh, is a, a training for everyone who participates on our team. And that includes uh, uh, training that I need to participate and do participate in. It's one of the greatest problems we have is the lack of training for what I call first responders, fire uh, uh, personnel, police, police judges, uh, jails, prisons. Uh, we don't have enough training to understand the challenges of the mentally ill, and we're getting so many more of them in the system. So Santa Clara County, your county, estimates that some 48%, almost half of the uh, prisoners in the jail in the county have some kind of a mental health problem. Why are there so many people with mental illness in jail? Well, I think there are a number of factors. One, we're much better at diagnosing mental illness. Another factor is that mental illness can be caused by the use of drugs street drugs, and the use of street drugs often by the mentally ill offenders, they substitute street drugs for their medications, 
which is unfortunate, but it ends up in an arrest and it ends up in more and more mentally ill people coming into the criminal justice system. Finally, I think, unfortunately, what's happened is that instead of addressing a serious problem as a community and as a society, we're using the courts and the jails as the place we send all the mentally ill instead of a hospital or a treatment facility. How do you, how do you determine whether someone who has a mental illness uh, is a potential risk for public safety? In other words, that they're not just, as we see often in San Francisco with homeless people screaming and yelling, talking to themselves, uh, how do you know wh whether someone is a risk, at risk of picking up a knife and, and killing someone? You do a very thorough assessment you know their prior history, you know what the mental illness is, you know the circumstances that brought them to you. Uh, you, you have a lot of information. If you don't have all that information, you will not make good decisions. And so- How often is a mistake made in that regard? Um, in, in my court, uh, I, I can't think of any uh, errors uh, in, in the past, uh, oh, I would say at least eight months. Errors will be made in this sense. Mentally ill people will commit uh, new offenses, uh, but the idea that everyone who's mentally ill is violent um, is just untrue. There is no evidence to support that. That is all about stigma. We feel uncomfortable around the mentally ill, whether we're a judge or just somebody in the community. We want something done about it, and we turn to the courts to take care of it. Instead of trying to understand the problem, and work with the mentally ill in the community. So there are very few, if any, uh, who go on to commit uh, violent offenses when they are participating in a treatment program. So uh, just one of the many myths that people have yes. uh, that, that exist out there. Yes. So uh, if, you could, uh, if you could change anything, uh, you've had 20 years of experience now with your mental health uh, treatment court. If you could change one or two things about the system, starting from the police uh, all the way up to correctional uh, guards in prisons, what would you change? Well, I'd start out by having better training about mental illness and working with the mentally ill at all levels. Um, I would work, uh, I, I serve on the Council for Mentally Ill Offenders, and uh, it's a state body and we are strongly supporting diversion. That is, why do we need to have every mentally ill of offender in a jail? Why aren't we making that determination about public safety and treatment at the front end, and then diverting them into a facility or into a program that is not a jail or a prison? And if we did that, we would cut down the number of people to come in. Next, the minute the offender gets to a jail, we should start planning for their release. Everyone gets out. And if we don't have a, play, a plan in place, they're going to reoffend, and they're not going to receive treatment. Yeah, so jail, clearly not the best, or prison, not the best place for these, uh, for these offenders. Not at all. All right, Judge Manley, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been almost 10 years since a federal judge ruled that California's method for executing death row inmates was deeply flawed. In 2006, Judge Jeremy Fogel said the state's lethal injection procedure risked violating the Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Since that ruling, executions in the state have been put on hold. California corrections officials are now promising to develop a new lethal injection protocol by the end of this year. Over the past decade, as pharmaceutical companies have limited the supply of drugs used for such executions, other states have faced legal challenges to their lethal injection procedures. Earlier this year, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Oklahoma's lethal injection process. Separately, two states, Connecticut and Nebraska, banned capital punishment. Scott Schaefer spoke to Judge Fogel about the impact of his ruling. Well, it's been almost 10 years since your decision in the Morales case stopped executions here in California, and there haven't been any executions since then. I'm wondering what kind of reaction you got from the public, especially just after the decision, but since as well, emails, mail, people bumping into you, talking to you. What have you heard from the public? I haven't gotten much of anything um, recently. Uh, I mean, I, Maybe as a result of doing this interview with you, I'll start to get some more. But, but uh, back when the case was, was really live, certainly when I blocked the execution back in 2006, 
uh, I got a huge volume of, of response. Uh, and, and some of it was, some of it was positive. Um, most of it, I have to say, was actually quite negative, and it was from people who thought that I was, what I was doing was protecting Michael Morales. What I was called upon to do and what I had to do was to assess whether this particular lethal injection protocol, as administered, was safe. Um, and uh, or whether it would uh, inflict an unconstitutional level of pain. And the, the, the framework of the case and the facts of the case, it was a, a pretty straightforward call that I had to make. It really had nothing to do with how I feel about Michael Morales. And I think judges, you know, have to be ready for that. I think that's part of the, the um, um, part of what we sign up for, that, that sometimes we do something because uh, we believe we're compelled to do it by the law and the facts of the case and the public sees it in a different way, which is their right to do, um, but it's not something that's really anchored in, the, in the, the law and the facts of the case. It's based on their emotional reaction to what they see. As you can imagine, proponents of capital punishment, victims of crime, uh, are frustrated. They're angry that executions are not being carried out in California uh, for the past 10 years. Um, what would you say to them? I understand their frustration, and if, if I were in their shoes, I would feel frustrated. The legal issue in the Morales case, purely and simply, uh, always has been what is a constitutionally adequate means of carrying out executions uh, in California. There's no uh, question in the Morales case as to whether executions ought to be carried out in California, whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. I tried very hard, I've tried very hard in every case I've ever had to decide the case based on the facts and the law, but you it's very hard to ignore, particularly when you, you pick up the newspaper and you read about the case the next day or you, you see it on TV, that, that people have strong feelings about capital punishment that end up getting attached uh, to a case like this. Earlier this year, in June, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that Oklahoma's lethal injection procedure was constitutional. And they've said in the past that capital punishment generally is constitutional, and therefore there should be a constitutional way to carry it out. So. What's the dispute in this case? I think where the Chief Justice is coming from, where the majority in, in the case you just mentioned uh, is coming from, in part is that the Constitution actually specifically refers to capital crimes. Uh, if you look at the, at the uh, Fifth Amendment and there's some other references to capital uh, crimes in the Constitution, uh, obviously at the time of the framing of the Constitution, it was contemplated that there would be capital punishment. So that if you have that originalist point of view, it's, it's pretty hard to reach any other conclusion. Um, there's another line of legal thought, which is that the Constitution is an evolving document, conditions change, and, and that uh, in light of today's uh, standards, uh, perhaps capital punishment is no longer constitutional. That's an argument that will rage at the level of courts much higher than the one that I sit on. These issues are, of course, uh, life and death issues. Uh, do you feel like you should um, witness an execution? I think it's important that people do witness executions. I think uh, one of the unfortunate things that's happened uh, as a result of all the litigation is that in some states uh, there's been an, uh, perhaps a tendency or perceived tendency to, to just go behind the curtain and, and, and not uh, not make these transparent and public proceedings. I think they need to be. And, and I think that's true regardless of how you feel about the death penalty. I think it's important that people see, uh, see what we're doing. And then they can really form their own opinions. They can come to their own conclusions as to whether this is an appropriate form of justice or not. This issue has been kicked around in the courts for decades and decades. A lot of emotion on both sides. Um, do you think it'll ever be resolved? Well, I, I would never say we will never have a resolution. I think we are pretty polarized about it, in much in the same way that we're polarized, say, about, about abortion. Uh, I think there are some very deeply held and sincerely held uh, moral beliefs on both sides of the issue. And I think people have a hard time really hearing each other. I think most folks would, would agree, regardless of their views on the issues, that we have issues with arbitrariness, with costs, um, uh, with um, some other kinds of, of, of uncertainties that we, we could do better with. I know that before you were appointed to the bench, uh, you worked as an attorney for a nonprofit that advocates on behalf of people with mental illness. And I'm wondering how that experience affected you once you got onto the bench. I, I'd say it was the most important professional experience of my life. Um, uh, it, it really made me see um, how 
the legal system can do good and ill toward people and how important it is that we um, learn how to listen to people who are in court. Uh, some people are very articulate. Some people have very articulate lawyers. Uh, a lot of people are not very articulate. Some people can't express themselves at all or they express themselves in ways that, that scare people. And so, so a lot of things get missed. You know, that somebody can be mentally ill and their rights can be violated or they can be mistreated by someone or they can be um, uh, uh, denied a benefit they're entitled to. I think our s society does not do a good job of, of dealing with people with chronic mental illness. So you see people, uh, certainly in San Francisco, there's um, ample evidence of people who have chronic mental illnesses, mental illnesses and just aren't getting cared for. Living on the street. Living on the street. And then the other, of course, the other um, um, place you see them is in, in the criminal justice system because what happens is that people uh, commit crimes or they get in trouble uh, in ways that, that cause them to come into contact with the police in a criminal sense and then they end up in, they end up in jail, uh, they end up in, in, in prison and, and then they don't get proper care there. Judge Fogel, you've been dealing with these issues for years now and I'm just wondering how they've changed you as a judge but also as a person. It's made me more serious in some ways, and I've always been kind of a serious person, but I think it's made me realize how, um, how important what we as judges do is, how much rides on it, how much um, care we need to take to try to get things right, and also to recognize that we don't get things right all the time. And that was federal judge Jeremy Fogel. Thank you for watching. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. For Scott Schaefer, I'm Tui Vu. Thanks for joining us.